In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved people of God, today I'm going to be preaching on our first lesson that comes to us from Isaiah. Now you may know this uh, text, uh, whether you know where it comes from or not, because of the <clears throat> famous line that's at the very end, a line that is frequently used in, to be honest with you, a lot of pop Christian paraphernalia, meaning on mugs and wall hangings and Facebook posts and the like. That famous line, <clears throat> when I say it, I think you'll know it, is, comes from verse 8 and verse 9, where it says, Indeed, my plans are not like your plans, and my deeds are not like your deeds. For just as the sky is higher than the earth, so my deeds are superior to your deeds, and my plans superior to your plans. Is that a text that maybe you've heard before? Well, it's a nice passage. It really is. But as true as it may be, those two verses, well, unfortunately, they are often taken way, way out of context. So, our task for this morning is this. What is Isaiah saying here in this text to us? What does it mean? And why does it fall within the three-year lectionary cycle to come up during Lent? And how can we take then this message, this timeless message from Isaiah, how can we take that and incorporate that into our real life faith? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Would you please pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you so much for gathering us here safely today. We ask as we hear your word proclaimed through the power of the Holy Spirit that we may grow in our faith and also in our discipleship, learning to love and to serve you and our neighbor even more every day. Word of God, we ask that you speak to us this morning. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I look back, <clears throat> just because I was curious, and since I've become a pastor and gone through the cycle now uh, about uh, four times, I've actually never, in the third week of Lent, talked about this particular text. With the exception of one time, one time before I became a pastor when I was doing my chaplaincy in Pennsylvania. And I have to tell you the story just quickly, if you'll indulge me, of how that went. Well, I was in a Methodist care facility in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. This was a huge, huge facility that ranged all the way from skilled nursing to people who lived in apartments or condos. Now, the original uh, founding of this place, when it was much smaller, started out as a retirement home specifically for uh, United Brethren and Methodist pastors and spouses. And that was something I learned right away I always thought United Methodist just meant Methodists united together, but the actual thing means the United Brethren Church and the Methodist Church, which united together. And I got reminded of that frequently. Well, the night before I was scheduled to preach, instead of working on my sermon, because it was this time of year, I was watching March Madness in college basketball with the idea that as soon as the game would be done, then I would put my final thoughts to paper on what I was going to preach on. However, I fell asleep. So I had nothing, and Bethany Village, where it was about 40 minutes from where 
our apartment was. And so I woke up just about an hour before I needed to be there, had a quick shower, maybe sped on the way up towards Harrisburg, and thought to myself, well, you know what, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just wing it. It'll be fine. Um, and so there I went. Well, we started off when we did this <clears throat> in the Alzheimer's unit. And it was one of the four sermons that we had to give that day. Well, and I, I mean this with all due respect, uh, as I've had family members who have suffered with memory loss issues, but let's face it, they had no idea what I was saying or wasn't saying, so the first go-around of winging it seemed to work. Second go-around, I was getting a little bit more a hang of it. Third go-around, I really felt as though I finally had got things going. But the fourth go-around was in a space that was three times the size of this that was absolutely and utterly packed. And I started out, as our text says, come, those who are thirsty to the water. And I had a glass of water, and I started going and talking and going through the text verse by verse. Well, long story short, my lack of preparation, well, not evident in the memory support unit, was definitely evident to that large crowd. And little did I know that there were over a couple dozen retired United Brethren and Methodist pastors in the congregation. I didn't think anything of it. I drove home, and the next morning when I came into the office, there was a stack of letters on my desk. And as I opened one after the other, they seemed to get worse about how I had no idea what I was talking about, how I didn't understand the context, how I was reading it literally, and that they didn't want to hear me preach at this place ever again. And so I think that that kind of made me gun-shy from this text after all of these years, because in a lot of ways, when you go through and when you read it, it seems as though it's self-explanatory, but actually reading it just literally when it's by itself, especially those last two verses that I read for you earlier, well, it misses what is actually going on here. And it also misses, especially when we look just at those last two verses, as at the power behind what God is saying and why we read this during Lent. So let's understand together today, I won't make this same mistake that I made, gosh, how many years ago would that have been? Josie wasn't born. A lot of years ago. Okay. <laughs> let's start with the context. Well, in order to understand what Isaiah is talking about, we actually need to go back and go back as far as the last few days of Moses. And you may say, my goodness, that was a long time before the Jews were in the exile. Well, it was. But this whole scene is set up, set up by what happens at the end of Deuteronomy. And if you go through and read, as I did last night, one more time, again before I went to bed, those last three or four chapters of Deuteronomy, you will, you will find this, this text and the foreshadowing that's in it. As you may remember, Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land, the same promised land that Several generations later, God's people would be removed from themselves in exile to Babylon. Moses wasn't allowed to go in. He was only allowed to go up on a hill, a hill where he could look over and he could see the end, the final goal of what everything they had been working for and been promised looked like. But Moses, as a representative of the people, was then given a strict warning of what would happen someday when people 
of Israel when God's people would go into this promised land. And I want you to listen to what God tells Moses in this case. Because again, this is a foreshadowing to the exile that happens. And also know, by the way, that this was supposed to be this joyous moment after wandering in the wilderness. And so you would expect that God would say something like, here is your land. You will enjoy it. Please prosper and have everything that you want. Instead, instead, God told Moses this. He said, soon you will lie down with your ancestors, meaning you're going to die. Then, and he skips right quick to this, God says to Moses, then these people of yours, they will begin to prostitute themselves to foreign gods in their midst. The gods of the land in which they are going, they'll forsake me. They'll break my covenant that I've made for them. For when I have brought them in to the land flowing with milk and honey, which I promised as an oath to their ancestors, as they have eaten their fill and grown fat, they will turn to other gods and serve them. They will despise me, and they will break my covenant. For I know what they are inclined to do even now before I have brought them into the land that I promised them. That's from Deuteronomy 31. Now, if you think about this, here they are again. Moses is looking over this great land. The people are overjoyed after time in the wilderness, after escaping Egypt. They now see what they could have. And this is the uplifting message that God gives them. <laughs> Well, fast forward to the time of Isaiah, and what do you know? To no surprise of ours, this is exactly the situation that the Jewish people were in, now in exile, that they find themselves. They had, when they went into the promised land, even though God would give them the abundance of all that they would need, they still turned to other gods. And as a result, that promised land that they were given as a gift was temporarily taken away again all because they put their trusts in someone else besides the Lord so it's against this vision and this backdrop that the prophet paints our first lesson and says here is the antidote to the generations of idolatry that you have committed that has put you in this situation. Your sins that you have committed have placed you here. But the prophet says, there still is hope. Hope for you even when the world around you seems bleak. Now if you look at our lesson, you can see how Isaiah brings this hope. The text opens with the imperatives where it says come, and it says buy, and it says eat, and it says listen, and delight, and behold. All of these wonderful things that Isaiah is saying, you will see again. You will see again, and you will have life. For there is no viable alternative to me, God says. This is the everlasting covenant that I'm promising to you. This is your new life. Now to the hearer on the edge of exile and in the midst of <clears throat> really awful displacement from the land that God had promised, this word that came from Isaiah, it was outrageous. It was frankly unbelievable. And in a lot of ways, People could not see in any way that it could be true. But the promise here is built not upon the scarcity of the exile that they were living in, but rather not about them, but about who God is and God's abundance. 
So the invitation begins with references to material, to water, to wine, to milk, and to bread. Meaning, God saying, I will provide for you all that you may need. And furthermore, the prophecy says, the Lord will ask the question, why do you continue to spend money on things that aren't bread and your labor for which does not satisfy? Listen to me, Isaiah says. Eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food, which is his way of saying, delight yourself in the Lord, the Lord God who made a promise to your ancestors so long ago and the God who will again renew that everlasting covenant with you. This outrageous message of hope is something that they see in spite of their own sin. And not just the sin of that moment or of that day or of that year, but the sin of generation after generation after generation. God says, my everlasting covenant, in spite of your poor choices, in spite of your misplaced priorities, in spite of your focus on other gods, in spite of the fact that you worry, in spite of the fact that you are consumed with anxiety, in spite of the fact that you have a fear of scarcity, in spite of all of this that has gone on for generations, God says, my everlasting covenant with you still stands. And I will not abandon you. Again, not because of who the people are or what they do, but because of who our God is. Which brings us then to the end of our text, these last few verses, the ones that can so be taken out of context because we like to personalize them and make them about ourselves. When we say, indeed, my plans are not like your plans, my deeds are not like your deeds, when we make that proclamation and understand that in terms of our God, we make it about ourselves. And we think that what that means is that, well, I'm not that far off. But that's not what it's about at all. It's about God's plans and God's covenant. And that even though it seems outrageous in the minds of human beings, God's covenant will be enough. So return to the Lord. Return with all your heart. For he is gracious and merciful abounding in steadfast love. Which brings us finally to what God is saying to us today. We too, as human beings, come from a long line, a long line of folks that constantly turn to other gods when we see scarcity, that constantly turn to fear that constantly can be consumed by anxiety. The power of sin does this to each and every one of us. And it can keep us from looking and grasping that life, all that we need, that comes through faith in our God. So today, hear this. With your confession, with your daily through your baptism returning to your merciful God. You are indeed acknowledging that his covenant, what he has done for us, is something that can never be broken. And this message, this message, when you hear that during this Lenten season, is what will point each and every one of us away from that understanding, that understanding that we are not enough, into an understanding of who we are through God's abundant eyes. It started way back 
with Moses before the people even entered the land. What you're going through is nothing new. So return to the Lord your God, for his covenant is sure forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.